arrival of 2019 brings new challenges, new opportunities for growth, and a whole new set of marketing trends. Our entire team has collaborated to put together what we see as this year's biggest trends to help move your marketing efforts forward. Today, we kick off our webinar series with how to win at content marketing. My name is Julie Holton, and presenting with me today is Alexis Newman of M Connections. I am the principal strategist and owner, a three-time Emmy award-winning TV producer and executive producer, before I launched into a career helping businesses grow their marketing and business development. A key member of our M Connections team, Alexis Newman, is a marketing strategist, and really, guys, she is our content guru. At M Connections, we are a marketing agency that focuses on strategic branding, digital marketing, and content creation. We are a team of writers, editors, designers, brand strategists, marketers, creators, communications specialists, innovators, and most importantly of all, trusted partners for our clients. Building connections is at the heart of what we do, so it's right in our name, M Connections. But enough about us, let's talk about you. With you in mind, our team put together a list of big marketing trends that we expect to really shape the marketing industry this year, and therefore, each of your industries and how you market your business. Everything from digital marketing to social media, graphics and design to video production, website accessibility, and more. We have a big blog on our website right now to guide you through several key areas. Coming soon, we will take this bird's eye view and really zero in, zoom in on each area through a series of videos and webinars designed for you. So today we start with content marketing. Solid content is the cornerstone of every successful marketing campaign. This is whether you're putting together traditional advertisements, Google AdWords, e-newsletters, blogs, social media content, you name it. Your content can make or break your ability to build a relationship with your prospects, maintain relationships with your current clients, and build those strong relationships with referral sources. It takes strong, authentic content to capture interest and create and maintain a relationship. And after all, marketing is all about building relationships. So let's start strong. Alexis, I'm going to throw it over to you. When it comes to content marketing, we have to start with a good foundation. Absolutely. So before we can talk about the specifics of content in terms of type, frequency, or quality, we have to have a solid foundation. And that involves establishing well-defined goals for your content marketing efforts that are clear, direct, and specific. So on the screen, you'll see these are just some goals to consider, um, things that you might want to do with your content marketing. You might want to establish yourself as an influencer and thought leader in your industry, attract new clients, retain the clients that you currently have, or increase your sales and return on investments. So some of these goals can overlap, and it's okay to have more than one goal in mind as you begin the process of marketing effective content for your business. But the reason that you want to spend time evaluating your goals and getting a strong understanding of what you're hoping to achieve is because your goals will determine the message you share with your audience. And content is really the vehicle for that message. So knowing what message you want your content to send will also help you determine what platform is the best choice to help you drive your point home. So from your website to social media, to emails, newsletters, online print ads, they'll all reach a different type of audience and they're all gonna send a unique signal to your audience. So the more clearly you define your goals and the better that you understand them, the better positioned you'll be to know how to make these various types of platforms work for you. So once you understand your goals and you've gone through that process, you have an idea of what the platforms, what platforms will provide the right support, then we can start the process of actually curating and creating that quality content. So the first thing to keep in mind is the importance of having a balance of content. And again, this is always with your goals, the front of your mind. So the only true hard and fast rule in marketing is that there are no hard and fast rules. But when it comes to content marketing, there's one good guideline that it's nice to try to stick to. And that is the rule of thirds. 
So this is big in content marketing, and it's a really helpful tool to help you keep track of what you're sharing and to remind yourself not to go too overboard in one area or another. So you really want to have the right balance of content. Generally speaking, that means one third brand promotion, which is sharing information about your services, your team, your business. Another third is outside content. So taking information from other thought leaders or partners in your industry or community. And the last third is custom or original content that comes directly from you, from your business. So we'll take a deeper look into these um, and we'll start with brand promotion and original content, which kind of go hand in hand. Um, they can sometimes blur the lines in terms of similarity and it's easy to be overwhelmed by the idea that, oh my gosh, I have to create how much content? That's a lot. That seems like a lot of original content to come up with. But what you might not realize is how much of that information you have at your fingertips already. So there's no reinventing the wheel necessary. So looking at brand promotion, content like this can really help to attract and convert new clients. So brand promotion content might involve sharing success stories about your business, current or past projects, highlighting services that you provide that set you apart from your competitors, maybe tips and tricks and how to's. And those types of things will really give your prospective clients just enough information to remind them that they need the help of an expert in your field like you to support them. So again, if you're currently operating a business, I promise you that you have nearly all of this information already in existence. It's just a matter of going through it and sharing it with a wider audience and putting your own personal spin on it. Now, original content is pretty similar. This can involve sharing information about your business, but not necessarily related to promoting specific services. We don't want to get too salesy. So as an example, um, M Connections actually has a current client who provides a very specific sort of service in their particular industry. Um, so recently, an article on the effects of not utilizing that service popped up in the news, and we were able to take that content and share it on behalf of our client alongside their perspective as an industry leader in their field about that particular incident. So you could create original content out of current or newsworthy events in your field or industry, or maybe highlighting your community involvement and things that you're doing um, to get connected, or partnering with other businesses in your community on projects, which can help provide some cross promotion. So if we look back, we remember back to the rule of thirds, um, one third is brand promotion, one third custom content, which we just covered. That last third maybe seems like the easiest, which is sharing outside content. So if you're on social media, we see brands do this all the time. But it's not really as simple as just Googling relevant articles and throwing them up on your pages. There are some pitfalls that you want to avoid um, when you're sourcing outside content. So the first is watch out for competitor articles and websites. Um, you know, strategic cross promotion is possible and it can be really helpful. It's a powerful tool, but you want to make sure that it's purposeful and you determine it ahead of time and it's an actual partnership with the other business. So the last thing that you want to do is share a link on your social media page that sends people to your competitors' websites. Um, something else to watch out for, a lot of people are going to be looking at your social media pages or email blasts and following your links on their smartphones um, or their tablets. So do your research ahead of time to know what sites do and don't work on mobile. Um, we've encountered this issue in the past actually with M Connection's own social media pages. We had found this great outside content, but when we checked the website on our phones, we realized it was not formatted for mobile and it just wasn't readable. So therefore it's not usable for us to send to our clients. So make sure that you're checking websites for things like that. Also look for um, websites that have paywalls or too many pop-ups. And one of the reasons that I say that in particular about the pop-ups or paywalls is because when you're sharing content, regardless of what third it's coming from, it's helping you to form a relationship with your audience. 
and that requires them to trust you. So you wouldn't send your friend to a stranger's house without knowing who you were sending them to. So we don't want to send our customers or our prospective customers to a website without knowing whether or not that site is safe, without knowing whether or not it's secure, and knowing that the business that we're sending them to is a trusted authority on that particular topic. Speaking of trusted authorities, this brings us to the last thing to remember when sharing and sourcing content, no matter what type it is, and that's authenticity. So this is something that came up in our 2019 Trends blog, which is the importance of the human element for brands and businesses. Use your content to establish trust and communication. We want to encourage and facilitate discussions, ask questions, interact with your audience, show them who you are. At the end of the day, people already know that you're a business and you're trying to sell your services So we don't need to go overboard with calls to action or consistently plugging those services. There's that old saying, you know, friends hire friends. That applies even as a brand and business. When you're trying to grow your customer base, if someone who's already a client or customer feels a connection with you on a human level, if they feel that loyalty, you'll keep them coming back. So we've established our goals. We've talked about different types of content and how to source them, whether it's coming from your business or um, outside sources. We know we have to be authentic. So now what? Now at this point, you're ready to share your content, which means that it's time to tell your story. So the storytelling structure is the perfect tool for sharing content, really regardless of platforms. Because the structure of storytelling creates this inherent emotional response. We covered this in a recent blog on storytelling also. um, But while we actually, we often like to think that we make decisions based on logic, research shows that we actually make most of our decisions based on emotion. And then we use logic to kind of post-rationalize these decisions. So creating that emotional response from your audience with your content is the best way to get them to connect with you. So some of the ways that you can do that, you know, within a storytelling structure are to use inclusive language, like we and us and our makes people feel like they know you. You know, within the scope of your brand, use a conversational tone. You want to vary the length of your sentences the way you would if you were actually speaking out loud. And there's a pretty strong reason for doing this beyond the fact that you know, it just sounds nicer. The rise of voice queries is having and will continue to have a pretty huge influence on how content is found on the internet. So to match this conversational style and reflect the way that someone might search for content by asking Siri, Alexa, or OK Google a question is going to help better position you to address this trend. If you start now, as this continues to grow, you will be in a stronger position. So those are all really big kind of thematic elements of sharing content. But there are some smaller and more specific things that you can do to improve your content quickly and without a whole lot of effort. It seems obvious, but proper grammar is a big one. So things like the Oxford comma will provide clarity. Active voice instead of passive voice is going to perk up your writing immediately. And there are other specifics for social media of things that you can do right off the bat, like using the right hashtags in the right places, not going overboard on hashtags in the first place, Um, maintaining the appropriate length posts depending on your platform. You know, Twitter is going to be different than Facebook or LinkedIn and knowing when and how to use photos and links to support your message and drive your content home. In particular, if you're looking at a platform like Instagram, where a photo is going to have a lot more power than the words you're using. So that kind of takes us through the process. So establishing and understanding your content marketing goals right from the very beginning, using the right platforms, balancing content types to make sure that you're not overwhelmingly in one category or the other, And then writing that compelling content that's going to drive your message and help you to achieve the goals that you set out with in the first place. 
Perhaps the best part about establishing this foundation for content marketing is that you can use it in all of these areas that we've highlighted in our top marketing trends for 2019. They're all on our blog, and I just wanna to touch on how content marketing really reaches inside of each of these different areas. So social media, for instance, um, we get so many questions from clients about what type of content to be writing on social media, how to be incorporating it, do you use it on multiple platforms? And, um, and it's really important to know the algorithms of each of these platforms and how they work. I know algorithm is that word that we love to hate because it, it really influences what we can and can't do and how many people are seeing our content. That big data is a really great indicator of if your content is resonating with your audience. So use Facebook Insight insights, LinkedIn, Instagram, check and see what content is really impacting your audience. What are they engaging with? And go beyond the numbers. It's not just in how many views you get, how many, how many clicks are you getting, especially on LinkedIn, how many people are clicking to read into your article, how many, uh, how many people are actually reading through your content post. That's going to tell them, tell you one, if your topic is on point, and two, if the way that you are curating and creating your content, if it's resonating with your audience. So as we look through here, another key topic is on email marketing. Did you know that using URL shorteners like Bitly, how many people use Bitly? Or maybe you are one of the users who can still use the Google URL shortener. If you use those in an opt-in email campaign, it could be sending your emails right into the spam folder. That's right, programs like MailChimp and Constant Contact, they are governed by an entire set of rules called can spam laws. So just like those social media algorithms that we love to hate, if you don't follow these rules for the can spam laws, your content gets canned. And who wants your work to go right to waste before anyone in your audience even sees it? So make sure and check out, we have two blogs on our website that will really help you walk through point by point. We have five ways to improve your email marketing and the basics of email marketing before hitting send. While you're on our website, be sure to subscribe. We send out just a once a month email so that you get um, news you can use, ongoing changes in marketing and business development so you can focus on what you do best, your business. So we're gonna come up now, um, open it up to some Q&A. Before we do, we have a live poll. If you go on the chat box side of your screen and look at the third tab down, there is a poll there. Which webinar topic would you like to see us do in February? Digital marketing, more content marketing, social media marketing, graphics and design made easy, video production, website accessibility, project management tools for marketing, something else, let us know. Vote in the poll now. Looks like website accessibility is uh, the first vote. We'll just keep watching here um, and see the poll is up now. Check it out on the right-hand side of your screen. Vote before the end of the webinar. Okay, Alexis, now let's take some questions. Um, one question that we get quite often, actually pretty much from every client we have and from people in the community, can I post the same content on all of my social media platforms? And this is kind of a, there's kind of a two part answer here, Alexis. So can I post the same content on all of my social media platforms? So the short answer is tentatively, yes, you <laughs> can. <Tentatively. laughs> but there are a few caveats that go along with that. It's not just a flat yes. So the first thing to keep in mind is, you've got different audiences across platforms. So you're not going to necessarily reach the same people on Instagram that you would on LinkedIn versus Facebook or Twitter. So you really want to figure out how you can focus your content to be platform specific and relevant to where you're going to be sharing it. And again, going back to the beginning of our webinar with your goals in mind. Um, the second thing to keep in mind if you're trying to share, you know, the same type of content or the same post across platforms is keep in mind things like post length on Twitter. Um, professionalism is a big one on LinkedIn. You know, if you're going to throw um, some exclamation points or, you know, open with a joke, things like that are, are good things to keep in mind when you know where you're going to be posting 
Um, and then remember the power of images and graphics on sites like Instagram and even Facebook. Um, video is a huge one on Facebook. So in short, you can use the same content across social media platforms, but make sure that you're putting in the work behind the scenes to really tailor that content for your specific platform so that it can get the widest reach possible. Okay, Alexis, you talked about images and photos, graphics. What about emojis? This is one that we go back and forth on on our team, but I wanna hear what are your thoughts on using emojis in content? So I have a little bit, talk about a love-hate relationship with algorithms. I have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with emojis, especially when you see them used by brands and businesses. Um, I think that they can be used well if used sparingly. And you also have to, you have to know your own business and your own brand. Is an emoji, the use of an emoji in a post, an accurate and authentic reflection of who you are as a business? And for a lot of businesses, it is, and it completely works, but it doesn't work for everyone. So I would say if you're going to use emojis, know your audience, know your goals, know your business, and do it in a way that isn't overwhelming and it's not going to detract from the content of the post itself. You want anything extra that you add to enhance what it is that you're already saying. Absolutely, and definitely keep in mind your platform too. There are some clients that we have, depending on their industry, where we do incorporate emojis in once in a while. Again, it depends on the professionalism and their industry, but LinkedIn, for example, is a platform that we just tend to stay away from ever using emojis. It's just not what that audience is looking for, so great ideas there. Um, Alexis, you also talked a lot about authenticity, and this is something that comes up a lot. And we we even posted an article not too long ago that our audiences of all generations are looking for authenticity. They're looking for, and, and, and from businesses of all sizes, they are looking for CEOs to care about issues, to take a stand on community issues and, and have a voice and, and use that voice as a part of their business brand. But this can also be tricky. How would you recommend a business come across as being genuine or authentic without sounding the opposite, like they're inauthentic or they're overdoing it? So that's a great question. And I think um, that's another thing that, you know, if you're on social media, you see brands really trying to walk that fine line of establishing authenticity while also not coming across as too familiar. And I think maintaining that professionalism is really key to success when you're talking about authenticity and that human element. You want to maintain that professionalism that reminds people that you, you're the business, you're the service experts, you're the providers, you can solve their problems, but you want to create connections. So being human and relatable is about thinking about the types of issues that your clients or your customers might face or that you yourself face as a consumer. And what do you want to hear from the brands and businesses that you work with? So really putting yourself in the client's shoes to try to determine, you know, what kinds of problems can we solve for them? Because demonstrating that you have an understanding of the problems that they're facing is human. That says, I get you, I hear you, you know, I know what you're going through and we've got solutions, we're here to support you. And that really is an authentic human response and that's what people are looking for. So I think maintaining that professionalism while connecting to issues and concerns and needs that they're having is really going to set you up for success when you're trying to walk that fine line. Let's tie this into a question we've received on storytelling. So when we talk about storytelling, and by the way, everyone on our M Connections team comes to M Connections with a very strong background in writing. And so as you can tell, we're very passionate about content and we're very passionate about storytelling. But when we say storytelling, it might have a different connotation than when someone else uses the term storytelling. So we're not talking about making up stories. And, and sometimes that can be um, kind of, it, it could maybe sound that way. Like we're telling you to come up with something. 
And, and obviously, Alexis, this ties back into the idea of being authentic and being genuine. Storytelling doesn't mean that we're creating this elaborate story, this scheme of some sort to sell a product or service. Storytelling for us is all about looking inside. Everyone has a story. Everyone has um, a tale to tell about why they do what they do, how they do what they do. And, and that's what we are describing when we talk about storytelling. What would you add to that, Alexis? When, when you're talking about storytelling, how do you define that? So one of the ways that you can look at storytelling is, you know, really kind of to break it down. I mean, it's, it's getting people invested in what you're saying. You know, you think a story has a beginning, a middle and an end. It's got, you know, there's something there, there's depth there. And it really just gets people hooked into what you're saying. So for me, and, you know, when I think about putting together social media posts, that's kind of what I try to go for. You know, I'm going to present a question or a problem or a scenario or some information, and I'm going to really lead the reader, prospective client, current customer, whoever it is, through the process of, you know, here's a situation, here's a scenario, here's some information, and I'm going to walk you through that to get to either sharing the content itself or directing you back to my website or answering the question and providing you with solutions. It's all about really hooking people in and giving them something to follow and something to process. So we have a question from David Smith. How do I figure out which social media platform is the best for me to post on? Dave, that's a really great question. Alexis, you wanna jump in on that first. How do you pick your platform? Yeah, so I would say you got to go back to your goals. And when you look at your goals, that helps you define who is your audience. You know, you can't set up a goal for your content without knowing who your audience is. And that comes from an understanding of what your business is and what your what services you're providing. So when you're thinking about, you know, what's the right social media platform for me, some of that can take some research in terms of demographics. If you have a certain um, category of clients that falls into a particular gender or age range or um, you know professional level, whether it's um, people in the business world or maybe it's students or it's you know stay at home moms, whatever it is, doing your research to know where those people are on social media, that's key. Depending on what your business is, you might not need Instagram. You might not need LinkedIn. It's all about knowing the demographics of your audience, both your current clients and your prospective clients, and figuring out where they live in on, out on the internet, out in the world of social media. Absolutely, and, and knowing also what content platform is going to help you stand out. This ties right into his follow-up question, which there is so much going on on social media. How do I stand out? which is a really great question. There's definitely a lot going on on social media. And it really starts with knowing, first of all, your goals. What are you hoping to get out of your posts on your, posting your content on social media? Are you looking for specifically for buyers? Are you looking to grow a community to eventually sell something? Are you do you have some other goal in mind? Are you just simply growing awareness for your brand? All of these things will influence how you can stand out because then you're going to focus on the platforms where your audience is. So that audience research is the next step there, David. And you're really going to look at um, where is my audience and what mindset is my audience in? So, for example, I bet that pretty much everyone here in this in this webinar today is on a variety of platforms. I would say you're probably on at least three or four that you use regularly. But when you're on each of those platforms, you're in a different mindset. For instance, when I go to LinkedIn personally. I'm in my business mindset. I'm definitely thinking with my CEO hat on. I'm there, I'm looking at other people, looking at their business related posts, and, and that's how I approach it. Um, so if you post something on LinkedIn that isn't connected to that business world, if it's unrelated content or ir ir irrelevant in some way or just not gonna interest them, then you're definitely gonna stand out for the wrong reasons. So think of the mindset that someone's in. That same CEO that's on LinkedIn and that business mindset, is also likely on Facebook, but wearing their different hat. 
maybe they're on Facebook um, after their evening meal with the family and they're in more of that family mindset, that, that mentality of looking at friends and, and personal connections post. So make sure to adjust your content on the platform that you're, that you're using to reach your audience. Okay, Alexis, we have another question. This one's from Michael. He says, when incorporating an outside content piece, how does one protect the right to such use? So he's talking about curating content here. And how do we protect our use for that content? That is a really great question. Um, so are we talking about outside content, like not content that you yourself are creating, but when you're going out and finding content from another thought leader or industry professional? Yes, let's talk about it in both ways. First, let's talk about how to protect our own content. And, and let's just say right off the bat, um, Alexis and I both worked with attorneys. Um, we still work with attorneys. Neither one of us are attorneys. So this is not legal <laughs> advice here on protecting yourself from using or from sharing content. Um, but what we do know is that you definitely want to be careful of what you're putting out there and making sure that your bases are covered. For instance, we have clients who are in the medical field and we have very specific disclaimers on any content we put out for them specific disclaimers that they're not providing medical advice that um, in certain scenarios you do need to see a physician to find out if something might be impacting your health so things like that you definitely need to know the laws that govern the area you're in and there are very specific guidelines and regulations depending on the industry our cpa and financial advisor clients have an entirely different set of regulations that we have to follow for them just like our lawyers do even for those of us who don't necessarily have specific laws governing our type of industry, we do have to be careful about using other people's content. And that's where I'd be most cautious here. Make sure that when you're sharing something, you are giving credit to the source. When possible, share it directly from the source. If you're sharing a link, for instance, we share a lot of links from other marketing or um, news newspaper sites, for instance, we, we share a lot of things from Forbes and, and other industry leaders that we follow. We make sure to give credit to where that information is coming from. Never simply read an article and copy and paste that information as your own. That's when you're really going to start to get into trouble there. That sort of cross collaboration, you know, not it's not so much that M Connections is working with Forbes, but we are cross posting their content and tagging them. And when you use a combination of tagging a particular business, whether it's a local business that you know, or some larger company like you know Forbes or one of those types of industry leaders, you're putting your name out there in connection with them and you are setting yourself up to be discovered across those social media platforms. And that brings it back to wanting to make sure that you're really using trusted sources. So like I said, you're putting your name out there in connection with that content, even though you didn't create it, you want to make sure that you're using sources and sending people to sites that are trusted and safe. And that's, I think that's a really big um, thing to remember when you're using outside content. Another thought too, real quickly there, Michael, on the other side of things, if other people or other sources are sharing your content, then you're doing a really great job of marketing. So that's typically the goal, especially with social media, is to have other sources, other influencers start to share your content. Now you wanna make sure that on your end of it, you're branding things properly. So make sure that your blog has your information, your contact info, your website is up to date. Make sure that whatever is being shared that belongs to you, has a clear and easy way for people to contact you so that you then see the benefits of that content being shared. But that's definitely, if, you're, if your content's being shared, then you wanna protect yourself, but you're doing the right things. Okay, next question here, and this has come up, this actually came up just yesterday with a client. Kristen is asking for thoughts on blogging. Is it still a great platform for messaging? Kristen, the easy answer is yes. And Alexis will, will talk in a moment on this. So one of the reasons why blogging is a great platform for messaging, Alexis talked about the rule, rule of thirds and blogging gives us a great avenue to do that. You can share your thought leadership, you can promote your own brand, you can educate, raise awareness, and you can also, in essence, then sell products and services through your calls to action. So. 
blogging is a great platform to use because think of when people go to read a blog and they're um, they're accessing that that information, accessing that information. They're consuming it from your site where you are the thought leader, you are the expert, your contact information is there. It's very different than if you're sharing information from a curated site. So let's say Forbes publishes a great article on social media marketing. It's wonderful for our team to be able to share that article because we agree with everything that Forbes says, but it's even better if we have our own article on our own blog that we can share because it puts us in the spotlight as the thought leader. It shares our contact information for anyone who might be looking for more information or more, or even better, our services on that. And so it really heightens the game and gives people that direct access to us. When I worked in news, we used to always say, we used to have a joke about uh, about the Ten Commandments, and that if if the Ten Commandments were given today, then God would say, "Here are the first three, and you'll find the rest on our website." And so, and you might notice in the news cycle, we get a lot of a lot of stories and information that way, where they only have a little bit of time to give you the news. That's kind of how social media is. There's just a little bit of space. Twitter only gives us so many characters. So you give the first three elements, and then you send people to your website to get the rest of it. And the reason why we do that is because we want to capture that traffic. We want to funnel that back to our site to begin curating, um, cultivating, and nurturing those leads into uh, whatever your ultimate goal is, whether it's selling something or growing a community, et cetera. So being able to send them back to a website with your content on a blog is a really great way to go. Alexis, what would you add from the content marketing perspective? So I would say, again, when you, um, just to, Julie, you covered that um, really well, but I think a, a couple things. One, you have to keep your goals in mind when you're blogging in order to be really effective, especially if this is going to be content that you're sharing then on your social media sites. Make sure that the topics that you're covering are varied. So keep in mind the rule of thirds and that they're all targeted for one reason or another, whether they're targeted for current clients, it's targeted for prospective clients, um, or even looking to boost your website's um, SEO. That's another really helpful thing about blogging is that it puts that content right there on your website. And I think a lot of people, when they hear blogging, they think just, I'm just putting information on my website and people who come to my my website will find it. It is about sharing it and knowing which platforms to share what blogs on and how to present that information. Um, and I think, you know, someone else had asked a question, David, you asked a question about posting too much or not enough. And I think that ties into this blogging um, concept is that you don't have to be blogging constantly. You need to find the rhythm for your business, for you um, and for your marketing, for your social media pages. But a blog can be every two weeks, every month, just enough content to direct people back to your website, to continue to maintain yourself as a thought leader and as a provider of these services in your industry. But it doesn't have to be this overwhelming task that you feel like you are stuck blogging all day, every day. Um, it's just something to help you boost yourself and give you some of that original content. A follow-up question here to the blogging question is about podcasting. Is podcasting better to spend your time on or is it harder to get those eyeballs or those listeners? This is a really great but complicated um, answer <laughs> because, um, and for me, I, I'll jump in first. I think it's two parts here. One, you're looking to reach your audience. So where is your audience? Is your audience listening to podcasts? If your audience is listening to podcasts, then absolutely it's worth the time and effort. Um, it also depends on where is that audience conversion happening. So whether it's a blog, um, a podcast, social media, traditional marketing, is it um, you know just getting out in the community and being live at events, giving speaking presentations, sending out flyers in the mail, you name it. You need to figure out where that conversion is happening as well. It's not just about reaching your audience, but where are you reaching them and then converting them into buyers of your goods or services? So for instance, 
Um, we also look at uh, what we call a rule. It used to be the rule of threes in marketing, like back in the day, probably before the internet, where, I mean, now we get the rule of threes in one post. You So the rule of threes is that for each piece of content you have, you want to disseminate that content through at least three different sources. So for instance, something happens that's newsworthy. You might as a business write a press release on it and send it to the newspaper for coverage. You might then also post it on your blog, so then it's on your website. And then you might share it across multiple social media platforms. And you also might throw it in um, to your email newsletter to go out to your clients to let them know that this newsworthy event has happened. So there are several ways that we can do this. Think of the same thing when it comes to blogging and podcasting. So if you have a podcast, make sure you also have a blog that goes along with it. Because whether you have that auditory person who's going to listen in while they're working or driving or whatever they're doing and they like the audio, you can capture them that way. Maybe you have someone who is more apt to read the transcript of your podcast. So having a blog with that full transcript will be the best way to go there. And then as a third, let's throw in social media. Let's throw in some other way to reach and connect with an audience so that you're leveraging the most out of that podcast or blog. The other thing too, David, I said this was two parts. I really think that it comes down to what do you like to do? So we talk a lot about how to connect with our audience, but let's be real, at the end of the day, we're the ones spending the time doing the work. So how do you enjoy connecting with your audience? Do you enjoy being out speaking at events? Do you enjoy sitting down in front of a microphone and having a podcast? I know I do have a podcast with two other women called Think Tank of Three, and it's a great way to connect with an audience. Do you enjoy blogging? Some people don't like writing. If you don't like writing, then blogging may not be the best route for you to take unless you have the ability to bring in some ghost writers to help you with your content. So I think we also need to keep in mind, what are your passions? What do you like doing? What do you enjoy doing? And how can you use that to connect with your audience? Alexis, what would you add? Well, I think that point about your passions is a great one because what you really want Regardless of what you're doing, whether it's a podcast or a blog or social media, you want consistency. So if you're going to start a podcast, what you want to avoid is doing two or three of them over the course of a couple of months and then it just disappears. You know, I think we've all visited websites or social media pages where the business set it up back in 2014 and hasn't posted except for those first three days and now it doesn't give a very good impression. That business could be alive and kicking and could be full of customers and clients and have projects coming out their ears, but you wouldn't know it by looking at their website or looking at their blog or looking at their social media pages. So I think to Julie's point about, you know, what are you passionate about and what are you, what do you feel invested in in terms of types of content and ways to share content? That's something to keep in mind. Start things that you can maintain that will help drive your business forward, that will give your business um, that authenticity that you can and that consistency that you can keep this going. So especially for these big projects like starting a blog for your business or starting a podcast, really have that conversation, an honest conversation with yourself as to whether or not that's something you can take on or are interested in taking on. Or whether, as Julie said, maybe you need to bring in some outside support to keep that going. All right. Last question here from Michael. Is there a place for ink and paper marketing? We've talked a lot about digital, haven't we, Michael? Alexis, what do you think? Is there a place for ink and paper? I know your answer. <laughs> I know your answer. Absolutely. I love ink and paper marketing. I think that it is just as powerful of a tool as digital marketing. And it really does kind of get swept aside. You know, there's this huge push for everything is on the internet and everything is, um, you know, on social media, but you can do more than that. I know um, Julie and I in the past have both worked on projects for newsletters that get sent out to clients so that you have something to hold in your hand when you're talking about going to conferences or going to presentations and you want flyers and um, brochures and things like that, those also communicate a message. That's content marketing. It's your content right there. Now, it may direct people back to your website at the end of the day, but that doesn't mean 
that it's not a great place to spend your time. And I think, you know, to that point, again, knowing your audience is critical because if you have an audience that is mostly a group of people that's not on the internet as frequently, ink and paper marketing might be the best way to go. You still want to have that online presence, but that's an area of focus and it all is really dependent on your audience and how they want to be communicated with. But I would hate to see businesses and brands forget um, that, you know, ink and paper, that hard copy marketing is really, um, really important. Really important and really powerful. Thank you, Alexis. That's all the time we have for today, guys. I'm jumping over to our poll real quickly to see which webinar topic you would like to see from us in February. We've got 33% uh, say social media marketing, 44% say graphics and design made easy, 22% for website accessibility. Well, guess what, guys? We're gonna have all of these topics coming up in the next few months, so we will let you know. Looks like graphics and design might make an appearance in February. We will let you know. Look for those emails to come out on that. In the meantime, you can reach us through email with any more questions that you might have. Julie at mconnections.com, Alexis at mconnections.com. You can also connect with each of us and with M Connections on social media. And guys, if you found this webinar helpful, let us know by sharing the information on the replay on your social networks. Maybe it'll connect with someone who needs to hear it. Thanks, everyone. Have a great Thursday and best of luck as you win at content marketing.